Jacksonville is a growing community. With 300,000 new residents moving into the state of Florida each year, we are witnessing a rapid, if not explosive, rate of growth. But growth encourages production, and every process for producing useful things also yields dangerous or hazardous byproducts. Take a look around you. Whether at home, in a classroom, or at work, you are probably surrounded by things which at some point in their manufacture involved a hazardous waste. Dyes in the rug, paint on the walls, the synthetic fabrics in your clothing, even the plastic garbage bags we use to dispose of our waste all produced some hazardous byproducts. What do we do with our waste? Is there a way to handle it safely? In this program on Jacksonville's environment, we will examine some of the problems we face as a growing community. Although Jacksonville has a bright future, it also has a past. Whether through lack of awareness, motivated by economic interests, or simply not knowing any better, we have tried to bury our trash and ignore our problems. We now have to face some of the problems from our past. This is a growing list of sites in the Jacksonville area which have been environmentally contaminated. They all involve the mishandling or improper disposal of hazardous waste waste which may be harmful to human health or to the environment. Yvonne Woodman and her family bought property on the Hips Road landfill in 1970 because they wanted to get away from the stresses of city living. Although told that the landfill had been completed, problems soon became apparent. And when we purchased the property in 70, it was totally barren sand only. We understood uh, then it was supposed to have topsoil and vegetation on top of it, which was never completed. We asked our city councilman at the time uh, what, you know, why it was never completed, and he researched it for us, got back to me and said it's been written off as, as satisfied by the sanitation department, the money has changed hands, there's nothing you can do. But the lack of topsoil and missing vegetation were merely indications of deeper, more serious problems. This is an aircraft tire. It says Goodyear aircraft rib. And it looks like it was set here, but it wasn't. This is, this is all stuff from the landfill that was buried here that has surfaced. Take a, a shovel and, and dig through some of this. It's, it's incredible what you're going to find. Cans. I took uh, a can to Washington last summer that was recovered here approximately six inches below the surface of the landfill. And on the can, it had the hazardous warning label. It had methyl ethyl ketone. What is a hazardous waste? Why is this an environmental problem? All industries generate waste. And collectively, these are referred to as solid waste. To be considered hazardous, a waste must meet at least one of four criteria. Ignitability, corrosivity, reactivity, or toxicity. If not handled properly, hazardous wastes can burn, eat through their containers, explode, or release poisons that pose a substantial threat to human health and the environment. Some examples of organic uh, hazardous waste, uh, organic solvents, would be uh, methyl ethyl ketone, which is a cleaning solvent which was used quite a bit, uh, toluene, which is a paint solvent, xylene, which is also used as a paint solvent, um, methylene chloride, which is a common degreaser, 111 trichloroethane, which is a common degreaser. Uh, these are very small molecules. They tend to move very rapidly, you know, in the groundwater. Um, some other ones that would be classified as hazardous waste are uh, a very common one, creosote. Uh, it's used as a wood preservative. Uh, it's very common here in the south. We have a lot of uh, facilities in Florida which do wood preserving processes. The Resource Conservation and Recovery Act of 1976, often referred to as RICRA, assigns responsibility for ensuring that hazardous waste is safely and legally discarded by the company that produced the waste. The EPA has also established guidelines for monitoring these wastes. Well, there's 50,000 different chemicals, I guess, generally, roughly counting. Only about probably 300 or so are listed under RICRA and are covered under RICRA. That leaves a lot of waste out there that could be toxic to someone that are not classified as hazardous wastes. People have 
come up to us and said, how do you know there was toxic waste in there? Well, of course, the, the results of the test indicate that there's toxic something out there poisoning our water. From what we can gather, dumpsters were picked up at the bases and brought to Hips Road uh, for disposal. Who knows what was in the dumpsters? We're finding out what was in the dumpsters. The real fear that we all share is that some of these hazardous chemicals through improper disposal will get into the air, our food, and in the case of Hips Road, into the water supply. Seepage from materials dumped into the landfill leaked out and contaminated some of the Hips Road wells. How does this happen? How does seepage from underground waste find its way into our underground reservoirs? Under the Earth's surface lie huge underground reservoirs. More than half the people in the nation depend on this groundwater for drinking water. More than 80% of rural families rely on it. If waste is simply buried in the ground, dangerous chemicals may seep out and contaminate this precious supply of water. In the past, poorly designed dumps allowed waste to mix with rainwater or other forms of moisture. The liquid formed by this process, called leachate, often moved down through the soil to contaminate the water supply. Scientists once thought that groundwater could cleanse itself of pollutants like these. But they now know that this underground supply moves very slowly. Once it becomes contaminated, it's expensive and technically very difficult to clean up. Here in Florida, we are particularly vulnerable to contamination from hazardous waste, where 90% of our drinking water comes from the ground. Florida has the, the most delicate environment of any state as urbanized and as populated uh, as ours is, particularly with respect to water supplies. The more we're hearing about contaminated water supplies and the effect of hazardous waste, the more we uh, realize that this is a very uh, limited resource and Florida has consumed it and used it in many cases unwisely. The common method for disposing of any solid waste prior to the Resource Conservation Recovery Act coming into power was to dispose of it in the landfill. That was the common accepted practice. Um, a few years ago it was a very accepted practice because they didn't think that the groundwater would be affected by the leachate coming from the landfill. Everyone thought that there was enough uh, purifying uh, time and enough dilution in the groundwater that if these materials ever did get in the groundwater that you would never be able to find them. At Hips Road, the hazardous materials buried in the landfill did seep out and get into the groundwater. Tests confirmed that drinking water wells were contaminated. These wells take water from an underground reservoir known as the rock aquifer. What are these aquifers? How do they supply water? There are three aquifers in, in Duval County. Uh, the the uh, first aquifer, the closest to the surface, is what we call the water table aquifer. And that's uh, strictly the sand beds that go from land surface down to about maybe uh, 10, 20 feet. Rain that falls on that aquifer recharges it directly overhead. The next aquifer is down anywhere from 50 to 125 feet, and it's what we call the rock aquifer. And it's, uh, oh, anywhere from 5 to 25 feet thick, and it underlies most of the county. It's, and the, this is the aquifer where most of the shallow rock wells are in, these small domestic wells. The third aquifer is down anywhere from 450 to 550 feet below the surface, and that's the principal aquifer. It's called the Florida aquifer and that's about 1,500 feet thick, at least, or 2,000 feet thick. And that's the aquifer where, where most of the large city wells are, are where the city of Jacksonville obtains its water supply. Most of the core, what we refer to as the core city, the older city, is on the city water system. Probably around 25% uh, of the county is still remains on individual wells. Uh, and particularly as you get further and further away from the central areas. Everyone's familiar with, uh, in Duval County, is familiar with some of the shallow groundwater contamination that we've had. Hips Road uh, is probably the most, uh, the one that received the most press. Uh, land, uh, other areas around Morse Avenue. 
and uh, some of the problems are that when you have many individual wells around, when these wells go bad, when they become contaminated. Some of the wells around Hips Road did go bad. Residents were dismayed to learn that their drinking water wells were contaminated. Well, Hips Road, there, that happened to be an area probably where the shallow aquifer and the shallow rock aquifer, the surface aquifer and the shallow rock aquifer, there was no connection or very, uh, no separation or very little separation between them. And the contaminants were able to go from the shallow sands into, the, into that shallow rock aquifer. At that site, we have found mainly the solvents again, the uh, toluenes, the MEK, the um, IBK, isobutyl ketone, was also a contaminant there. We have not found metals or pesticides or PCBs or any of the uh, polynuclear aromatic compounds. So it appears right now that we're only dealing with the solvents at that point. There are a number of other areas where that's happened too. A lot of areas on the west side, for example, a lot of gas stations leaking, uh, leaking uh, petroleum products on the west side of town. Another landfill that um, made a lot of publicity was the Morris Road landfill because that is another landfill that contaminated wells adjacent to that or appears to have contaminated wells adjacent to it. So that one has come to the attention. Uh, another site was the uh, White House oil pits. Uh, those became a problem because they contaminated the surface water. Uh, one of the little tributaries to McGirt's Creek back in the 70s uh, became contaminated because one of the cells wall blew out and dumped this material into the creek and thus those became evident that they were a problem and the city went in and, and took care of that by closing it off and capping it. The city of Jacksonville also responded to the contaminated water problem of the Hips Road residents. City water lines were run out to the area and residents were provided with the option of hooking up to city service. But city water is also in need of protection. One of our neighbors said like, gosh, when you think of groundwater being contaminated and it, it continues and, and uh, destroys aquifers, our safe drinking water aquifers, that's like imagining the sun going out, there's no sunlight, or standing in line to get safe drinking water like we did during the, the oil embargo for gasoline. We have to protect all of our groundwater sources. Along with Hips Road, the White House oil pits qualified for some of the $1.6 billion Superfund cleanup money. This fund, appropriated by Congress, is made available mostly through taxes charged to chemical and petroleum companies. But as these areas wait, other sources of contamination are being found. Right now, there are at least five agencies testing our groundwater for contamination. A study by the Northeast Florida Regional Planning Council has found 70 abandoned dumps and seven closed landfills in Duval County. In Duval County, I think they've defined approximately 70 some odd old landfills. Uh, how many of those contain hazardous waste? We're not sure right now. As far as landfills are concerned, you have to look at when the landfill operated to determine if the landfill is hazardous or not. Back in the 40s and 50s in Duval County, the generation rate for hazardous waste was probably still very extremely low and didn't move up in, into the, to what we call a hazardous problem until we got into the late 50s, early 60s, when we started a, a fairly large industrial process processes in, in Jacksonville that were using materials that would be classified as hazardous. Those are the landfills that need to be looked at for a hazardous waste problem. The older landfills, the smaller dumps, and also where the landfills are located. That's very important because the ones that were closer to the industrial areas are the ones that would probably be used first. And so those are the ones that need to be looked at. It's the time frame that you have to look at and also the location of the landfill. Not all landfills or old dumps are going to be hazardous. Landfilling has been an accepted practice for a number of years, but open dumps and uncontrolled landfills were closed throughout Florida in 1973. The state legislature passed a law which basically said there will be no more open dumping and we will go 
to sanitary landfilling. Basic differences between a dump and a sanitary landfill is a sanit sanitary landfill, unlike a dump, has is a controlled land disposed method. There's no open burning in a landfill. And if you can remember pictures of old dumps, and usually they just spread the garbage out on the ground and, and burn as much as they could. Um, you want to combine it in a small space as you can and compact it and cover it every day with dirt. That's basically to prevent odors and to prevent disease vectors, rats, flies, that sort of thing from causing a health problem. So in 1973, the city converted its open dumps into sanitary landfills or closed its open dumps. Sanitary landfills contain solid waste, but how much of this is hazardous? Because of Florida's delicate ecology, landfilling with hazardous waste has been outlawed in our state. Even though industries may produce hazardous byproducts, these wastes may not be buried in the ground anywhere in the state. What do they do? At this particular ally location, we manufacture, assemble, and test aircraft ignition components. We generate hazardous waste, as do all industries. Our waste, in particular, are solvents, test fluids. Most of our solvents are flammable. We are able to send those, once they're spent, to an incinerator. We have a particular incinerator we use that uses our flammables as a fuel. Uh, other materials we use, some of our chlorides, we're able to send to a recycler. We can either, he will recycle them, we can either buy them back from him or he will sell them to another customer. Some of our hazardous waste, we can't do either. We have to neutralize and bury. So the choices for hazardous waste generators are to incinerate, if flammable, to recycle, if the material can be used again, or to bury. Since waste defined as hazardous cannot be put into the ground in Florida, our industries send their waste to landfills in either South Carolina or Alabama. These are the only federally approved landfills for hazardous waste in the southeast. Because of the natural geology and special construction in these areas, these landfills are considered secure against contamination of groundwater, though critics contend that certain chemicals will get through any substance given enough time. Landfills are, in my opinion, uh, a dinosaur. They're, they're long-term storage. Sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with that waste again, okay? The, what we really need to do is reduce the volume of the material that goes into the landfills. We can reduce the volume by incineration, but only those hazardous wastes which are flammable and will not release noxious chemicals into the air can be burned. We can reduce volume by reclaiming or recycling, but in order to recycle, we must have materials which are reusable, and we must find companies in the recycling business. At this point, recycling is not very profitable. The fact remains, it's usually easier and cheaper to landfill. And since Florida does not allow hazardous material to be put in our landfills, we ship it out in trucks or by rail. It is normally a fairly expensive proposition to dispose of hazardous waste. We're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from $200 to $300 a drum of waste if it has to be shipped to Alabama. And the expense of the transportation is not the only nor the most serious problem. We must keep track of this hazardous material on the road. In order for hazardous materials to be transported out of state, a manifest system is used which, in theory, tracks the waste from the generator to ultimate disposal. This is a complicated set of procedures subject to various inaccuracies. The basic document governing the transportation of hazardous material is the Hazardous Waste Manifest. This cradle-to-grave policy holds the hazardous waste generator responsible for the waste until ultimate disposal. That document is generated upon when we give it to the transporter. It goes to the disposal site. We get a copy back from the disposer. And we try not to, when we incinerate or recycle, our liability is 
essentially over. When we bury in a landfill, the liability is still there. If that landfill were to go bankrupt or out of business, just the fact that Allied Bendix contributed to that landfill, we are responsible. So we are never totally rid of it unless we recycle it or incinerate. Never totally rid of it. Industries carry legal responsibility even through burial. But what about small waste generators like hospitals, dry cleaners, drug stores, or gas stations? Small businesses which may fall through the cracks of governmental regulations. And what about dangerous waste that are generated or spent in the common household? What do we do with our unused pesticides, cans of stain, old paint, oil from the car, or paint remover? Are these materials put in plastic garbage bags and left at the curb for the city garbage collectors to take to a city landfill? One of the things, we did a study for the uh, Department of Environmental Regulation through the um, Northeast Regional Planning Council. Now, that was to identify some of the small generators. And we know for a fact that a lot of that waste is going into landfills. And they're trying to stop that right now. I mean, this, this is against the law, but it's still being done. A lot, of large, a lot of large and small companies put it in lagoons and behind their plant or in front of their plants. And those, of course, are, are sources of contamination. And again, these are the things that are, are try, they're trying to get a handle on and stop those also. That's why the DER is so busy lately. Small quantity generators, I can tell you that a lot of the hazardous waste is produced by innocuous type operations. For example, dry cleaning plants uh, and uh, gasoline stations. These are small quantity generators. Um, household waste, a lot of that is hazardous. That's, that's uh, you know, painting, paint, uh, any type of paint discharge, uh, people that are saving paint cans, things like that. They're really innocuous. They're taken one at a time. They don't really mean much. But when you get uh, 500,000 people discharge using it, that, that adds up. 5% of all hazardous waste comes from households. Your pesticide cans, your oil that you drain from your, can your cars, your, uh, your lies, Lysol, Type that, all of these things, people don't even realize what hazardous waste is uh, or hazardous materials are. And you think, uh, one can's not going to hurt, but you take the whole population throwing away their discards improperly, and we have a major problem. To help the small waste generator and householder, the state mandated a one-time free disposal of toxic waste throughout Florida. During these amnesty days, People were encouraged to clean out their garages and warehouses to get rid of those unused chemicals under their sinks. Over 6,000 people participated in the project by bringing in paint cans, solvents, insecticides, pool chemicals, and weed killers. Over 550,000 pounds of hazardous materials were brought in at the 35 various sites throughout the state. Florida has taken the lead in its concern over hazardous waste disposal. Florida is the first state to sponsor such a program. I happened to be tearing down a, a building in the backyard and found all this stuff piled underneath some rags and everything else, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to get rid of it without throwing it in my trash can. In a state like Florida, with our Department of Environment, with our uh, Clean Water Act that we've just enacted and our Hazardous Waste Act that we've just enacted, and all the, it, all the uh, enforcement is in place, we're doing a wonderful job compared to the rest of the nation. There's a, lo uh, there's a long way to go, but uh, these other states will have to go a long, long way just to catch up to where we are right now. Yes, there is a long way to go, even in Florida. We still have to deal with our past as we plan for our future. And I think the ultimate lesson that I personally have learned, and a lot of us out here have learned, is that the public has been too complacent for too long to assume that government is taking care of us. It's time to strike up the ban, get involved. Government is only going to be as effective as the people. Now, also, the Water Quality Assurance Act, which was adopted last year by the legislature, has enabled the Department of Environmental Regulation to look at the effects of hazardous waste in the groundwater, the effects of previous 
previous disposal into landfills on the groundwater and also to establish a background water quality for the whole state. As government restrictions become tighter, proper disposal of hazardous materials has become more expensive and in some cases more difficult. Ironically, government regulations may have contributed to an increase in illegal dumping. Unfortunately, when faced with the choice of proper but expensive disposal versus illegal and cheaper discard, hazardous waste generators may become what are referred to as midnight dumpers. Midnight dumping has become a significant problem. Midnight dumping has been a very significant problem in the past, and it is not a problem that has completely gone away. We still have it occurring today. Traditionally, many of the people who were in the waste disposal business had a very small operation. They may own one or two trucks. They generally were not particularly savvy about the materials they were dealing with. They would essentially pick up anything. They would haul it away and dispose of it in the most convenient location. The problems of hazardous waste are real. More than 100 Jacksonville companies have identified themselves as handling hazardous waste. Many more handle similar hazardous substances which may jeopardize our health or the environment in the event of an accident or fire. In addition, we have small waste generators, as well as possible contamination from household garbage. What can the individual do? There's a, there's a lot that you can do, but the main thing that you can do is, is get involved. Uh, you'll find your way. If you just take that first step to say, I, I know there's a problem, don't sit back and say you can't fight City Hall. That, that is such a contagious attitude that has existed for so long and I was just as guilty. Uh, for the people in Duval County, what they can do and what they have been doing uh, is letting a regulatory official know if they see somebody that's violating the regulation or they think may be violating the regulation. People have been very helpful in that. But basically just the people need to take a, a personal view, a look at hazardous waste around their own home. And if they've got a, a large quantity for a home, let the landfill know. Call the uh, local authority. And if you ask me if I'm a chemistry major, the answer is no, I'm a high school graduate. But a lot of this stuff comes through common sense. You can learn so much through going to the library. That's the first thing I did. If, I, if we're going to fight a problem, we have to know what we're talking about. Talk to the people. I mean, we will be more than happy to talk to anyone on, about hazardous waste. There's no excuse for, for man not knowing uh, what is happening uh, through improper or illegal disposal of hazardous waste. We have to change. We have to change.